the basic shape and father of the modern violin we consider to be Amati. Now, um, his two main students were Guarneri and Stradivari, right? And these two um, makers, when we think about it, we think about them as being sort of the top two or two of the best violin makers ever. What we don't realize is actually Guarneri, the best maker, do you know the name of the, of the instruments that came from Guarneri? A lot of times you'll hear the term Del Jesu. Del Jesu is sort of the premier violins from the, from the Guarneri family. Guarneri Del Jesu was the grandson. Okay? The original Guarneri who studied with Amati at the same time as Stradivarius was the grandfather. Okay? Then there was the father, then there was the grandson. The grandson, his instruments are worth the most. His instruments are worth 10 million plus. Okay, when you're talking about the Del Jesu models. And a lot of times you may have a teacher who, if they really know what they're talking about, they'll say, is this a Del Jesu model? Okay? The reason it's important to know these two names, especially Stradivarius and Guarnerius, is because 99.9% .9 of every instrument you're going to sell on a violin and viola, violin and viola, and even cello in some ways, um, will be Stradivarius or Guarnerius. And probably 99% of them will be Stradivarius, 0.5% of them will be Guarneri, and then you might have a very small percentage that will be an Amati copy or this or that or so on and so forth. When we think about the Del Jesu, he actually lived to be the same around the same time period as Stradivarius. Stradivarius lived a quite a long time, and Guarneri didn't live a, a long time. So they actually made violins at the same time, though he, the, the grandson really wasn't necessarily an apprentice of Amati, if that makes sense. So you have a lot of these ideas, and at the time, really, Guarneri was seen as not necessarily a professional violin maker. Stradivarius was seen as an expert, and, and all of his dimensions are very precise. As you go through and you look at Stradivarius, you'll see most of his dimensions, they're very similar. He had a way of making violins, and he really stuck to that way. Guarneri, sometimes you'll see in some of the Del Jason models, the neck will be crooked. You know, you're talking a $10 million violin with a crooked neck, but he wasn't as precise. He still had his ideas on dimensions and what he thought about a violin should be, but completely different in um, their attention to detail, really. Okay, so, so Guarneris at the time was not seen as, as nearly the maker that Stradivarius was. Now, over time, his instruments have become just as valuable. The most, anybody know what the most expensive instrument that's been sold recently? There's an instrument that was sold, I, th I think I have a video of it, I'll, I'll see if I can pull it <coughs> out. Um, that was a Stradivarius and it was um, sold for <coughs> 17 million. Um, it was, they, I heard there was a report of somebody selling it by them for 20 some million, but I haven't been able to find <coughs> any information whatsoever on that sale. The, the difference between the modern violin, which is, you know, again, 350 years old, um, it, it's not t so totally different from some of the instruments before it. You know, the shape is somewhat similar. They just started really looking at archings and how, the, and basically <coughs> the amount of pressure that you could put on the instrument. Um, you know, back then, obviously, the strings were all gut strings, uh, what they called cat gut, which actually was a sheet gut, basically. Um, you know, that they would uh, dehydrate, and it was basically a piece of leather that they would, you know, um, put on the strings. So you didn't have the pressure that you have today, but even today, uh, even on some of your old Strad instruments, they do, they will put different strings on there. You know, these are obligatos, um, synthetic core strings. They had, they went from the gut strings to the gut wound strings to synthetic core, they have steel core. Those are all different tension strings, and even the old violins will still, for the most part, stand up to the tension that these new strings were put on them. So your, your, most of your um, real Amatis, nobody will put anything but gas strings on those at this point. Turtis model viola. Turtis model is, uh, it almost looks like a Guarneri on the top, but then on the bottom has very wide bouts. And what that does is it allows you to have a shorter string length with the volume. So. Those, those smaller um, viola players, I played at ASU with a, a girl that's like 4'10", and um, her teacher always wanted her to have a bigger sound. She's a fantastic viola player. She played on a Turtis model viola um, because 
it has a nice boomy sound, but it can be 15 or 15 and a half inches. So that was sort of a departure. There's that sort of slope shoulder one that allows you to get up. You don't see those a lot in modern violin playing. So mainly Strad and Turtis model are the two major viola models. And, and Turtis models are really important to understand because if you do have a customer who comes in or a teacher who says, I'm looking for something for some of my smaller students, that Turtis model is a great way to go. And most people don't know about it. The only people that sell a lot of Turtis model violas are string shops because they know about them and they know to offer them to the... Does the, Eastman Strings have a Turtis model viola? We make Turtis model in almost every viola. Okay. From a 305 <coughs> up, we make a Turtis model. Where did violin making start? Germany? No, nope, close. Northern Italy, just a little bit south of, of Germany, or what was, you know, what is now Germany. Um, started in northern, I northern Italy, right um, south of the Alps, and eventually it moved over the Alps, and it moved into Germany, it also moved into France, they kind of went two different ways. There's a place in France called Mirecourt. Mirecourt was a very famous um, place for violin making in France. We don't know a lot about violin making in, you know, French violin making necessarily in the U.S. because there just weren't that many French violin makers uh, who came to the U.S. They just didn't come here. We have a number of violin makers. Um, some of the violin shops that are in the U.S. today, some of the, the older really established, they, were, they all came from Germany. So we consider German violin making to be really sort of the the peak of the best violin making, but that's not always the case. I mean, there's some very, very good French um, violin makers and from other places as well. You know, obviously Italian, that's where it really started. Your Guarneri, Amati, Stradivarius, I mean, you know, just listening to those names, you know, they're just Italian names. So that's the genesis. As it moved over, um, the first place it went to in Germany was Mittenwald. Mittenwald was sort of, in some ways, considered to be the genesis of German violin making, okay? Mittenwald is in the south part of Germany, just over the Alps, and um, a famous violin maker named Klotz, K-L-O-T-Z, was uh, a violin maker who um, sort of started, you know, or was sort of the genesis of, of traditional German violin making, which followed very similar to the Italian violin making. French violin making, Bit smaller, <coughs> um, you almost sometimes you, you look at a full size French violin, you almost think it's a 7 8 because they tend to be a little bit smaller um, in size. But the Germans really continued the tradition of the Italian makers, okay. And then it eventually moved north even more into what um, was really considered to be East Germany, uh, and that was in uh, Marknerkirchen. Marknerkirchen is actually still a town uh, today that's very famous for violin making music and um, there's a company called Geva. Geva makes cases and they're distributed for all sorts of musical instruments in Europe. Uh, they're headquartered in uh, at least one of their major distribution centers is still in Market Kirken. And you know I've been there and, and you can literally walk into um, some guy's house and that's what he does for a living is to build violins. And uh, it's totally different than what it was when it was in Italy. As it moved north, and as we got later on, we, it went more to an assembly line format. So what happened is you had one guy making tops, and one guy making backs, and sides, and, and um, you know, scrolls, and putting stuff together, and all that. And so the group of you, you'd be at different families within the town of Market Nurkirk, and your job would be to make, you know, build tops all day long. That's what you did. And somebody else and their family, and their kids, would build backs all day long. And then you'd have a violin maker who would then put all that together. Okay? There's a, a famous name of early 1900s or you know early 20th century violin making. His name is Ernst Heinrich Roth. Very well known. Um, his great grandson, I believe, is still owns the company. And it's sure a Roth with that relationship with it. It is actually. So Ernst Heinrich Roth basically was was really one of the at that time, he was really one of the major guys who <coughs> got the sort of assembly line format, this production model, violin. Um, he really got this going. He really um, took these different sort of cottages and put them all together and started really making these assembly line violins. Now these assembly line violins were all done by hand. Okay? They weren't, it wasn't machinery, it was all done by hand. And um, 
after World War Two, in uh, I'm sorry, after World War One, in, in the mid '30s, is when his son came over to the U.S. and started the Sherilyn Roth Company. Okay. And um, then you also had Kurt Glacel, you had Carl Meisel, you had a number of these names that we know as sort of those old traditional violins. These were all violin makers and sons of violin makers who came over um, before World War II, basically. You know, when not everything started to look like it was turning bad, a lot of these guys left and they came over here. Um, and that's why we know so much about German violin making. We consider German violin making to be so good, it was because this is. You know, these are the people that came over. Okay, after World War II, everything went to machine-made instruments uh, in Europe, specifically. <coughs> Most of your violin making in Germany um, went automated. Cost originally went down immensely when it went from one guy and a few apprentices to an assembly line, right? Even though it was handmade, but then it went down even more because we were starting to use machine-made instruments, right, versus one guy with a top all day, you have a machine that would cut that top out. They're extremely consistent now, right? And what, what the problem with that is, is that now they're extremely consistent in build, but they're all very bland in sound, okay? This was a huge change in, in student violin making. What used to be, um, you know, you probably know the name William Lewis and Son. William Lewis and Son is now owned by Con Selmer. Um, before it was really made into a manufacturing um, company, it was a violin shop that specialized in student instruments. Well, student instruments back then were not what we really consider to be student instruments today. You're not talking the Sears and Roebuck, you know, $29.99 violin outfit back then. You're talking about an instrument that would go today for a thousand bucks, is what they would consider to be a student violin. Okay, at least at him, in his shop, would, that would be about what he would consider a student violin. <coughs> so um, this change really changed the way violins were thought of, especially with the, the um, increased numbers in, in school music and student players and so on and so forth. They started machine making them, and they started using products mm -hmm. like uh, laminated woods. You know, um, Laminated wood is great. What does it do for, for the durability of an instrument? Easy. Yeah, why? Uh, the grain of the wood goes different directions. Yeah, so you have grain going this way and this way, right? And they, they basically pull on each other and they make sure that th no splits happen in the wood, right? So it makes it very durable. Well, what's the problem with making wood from a machine or making the instrument from a machine, even if it's solid carp? What's the problem with that from a musician's standpoint? Well, you can't, you can't adjust as you're, as you're cutting something, you can't react to the wood. You can't. Yeah pokes out of that, that instrument, small yeah. changes that make it special. Right. So think about it. Every piece of wood is a living, breathing object, right? It's just like you. Every person in this room is different. You all have different variabilities. And instead, we're going to say everybody's got to be exactly the same, which is what we're doing when we're machine making an instrument, when we're machine making a wood instrument. We take all these different pieces of wood, and you have differences in grain patterns. You have differences in oils. You have differences in density. You have all these different variables, yet you're going to carve them exactly the same way. What happens is it, it just doesn't work out. It makes a very bland sounding instrument. Now you can make them very durable. By, you know, and then the other thing that they would start doing is they'd start using this very um, thick varnish, a nitrocellulose varnish, which actually they put on guitars today, right? And is actually seen as a, as a nice varnish put on guitars. But on violins, because there's so much movement, that varnish just restricts the wood. But it keeps, it helps from nicks and scratches and all those kind of things. So what you get is a very, very durable sounding instrument that doesn't sound very good. Okay? And this happened uh, basically in almost all violin making, and it crept up from where it was at a student level, crept up and up and up and up to today. If you buy a German violin under probably 10,000 euros, you, it's going to be machine made, okay? Now what they will do over probably about 5,000 euros is they'll do what they call hand work, which is they'll go, they'll, they'll um, put it through the machine and then they'll carve it, you know, they'll carve out the top a little bit. 
or they'll do some sort of hand, you know, maybe they might hand apply a varnish. You know, they might do some of that stuff to give it more value. Uh, but the body itself, again, pretty much for the most part under 10,000 bucks, you're just not going to get, um, you're not going to get anything that's hand carved. In 1992, this is when Eastman was born. So I kind of gave you a brief history of the company. Basically, what happened is that you had a couple of guys who trained in Germany and learned about the history of violin making and said, look, I can, we can build instruments the same way they did in Germany a hundred years ago. We can do that in China today. Why couldn't we use labor, which is much less expensive in China, to build instruments? So at that time, they just started using Chinese wood, which for the most part is not as good um, as, as you know, European wood, um, especially from that Romania area. Um, we call the Carpathian Mountains. Those are really sort of the sought-after tone woods. We're actually using, um, believe it or not, Adirondack spruce for some <coughs> of our, our violins now, which came from guitar building. And it was such good wood for, for guitar building that we said, let's try it. Mean, we're using spruce tops anyways. Let's try this Adirondack spruce. It's actually making a huge difference in some of the violins that we're making as well. You remember that Adirondack is sort of a general term. There's really not a lot of Adirondack or spruce coming out of the Adirondack Mountains at this point. Most of it's actually Canadian spruce, but it's basically the same, you know, tree, and they call it Adirondack spruce. Even on most of the guitarists from most guitar builders that you're buying from whatever, you know, call it Adirondack spruce. It's the type of tree uh, more than it is where it actually came from. As you can see by some of these pictures, we do everything by hand. And we've started to make some scrolls um, by machine because scrolls don't really affect the sound of the instrument. Um, and being able to at least generally cut the scroll and then go in and just finish it by hand makes the process quite a bit faster. So on our student level, on Model 80s, Model 100s, those, um, those scrolls are all being done in, you know, by machine. But outside of that, for up until about two years ago, the only um, saw or the only machinery that we had in our building was a bandsaw. Basically, we'd quarter cut wood and cut it into its piece, and then from there it would be all hand cut. Everything that you see here, this guy's hand cutting f holes. Um, this guy's scraping tops. Does anybody know why it's important to scrape a top, and what you would do differently if you didn't scrape it? What would you do? Nope. Sand it. So what you're just taking material thickness out of the top, right? So why would you scrape versus sand? Yeah, wood has pores in it. When you sand, it fills those pores. When you scrape, you pull wood out, and it leaves the pores open. The instrument vibrates better. Well, your your you know mass manufacturers who are building either really expensive or really inexpensive instruments, or you know just not putting a lot of handwork into it, they will actually sand those instruments. So they're going to cut them with machines. They're going to, you know, calibrate a machine to be it's going to be a certain thickness and blah blah blah. They send it through. It cuts it. It, you know, sands that top down. You know? <coughs> and so you're doing all these things that are really anti-sound because of quickness and cost and durability and so on and so forth. Okay. We're talking even the 100, 200, 300 yeah. models. Even our 80. Our even our 80. How do you get the hand. consistency then? We don't. I mean, every instrument, there, there is some consistency in that a top, a violin top is supposed to ring at an F sharp, okay? When you, our instruments are more consistent than, mo than manufacturers who use machines because they just cut the wood to a dimension. But if you change grain or you change these different things, you're not going to get that true F sharp. Where we actually tap tune our instruments, even on our 80s, it's limited, and we're not going to get it exact as we would a higher end instrument, but we do tap tune. So we try and bring that, that, the pitch down to an F sharp. Uh, so we, in some ways we do, our instruments are more consistent in some ways than um, your machine made instruments, if you want to think of it that way. But that being said, um, there's going to be wide varieties because you're going to have one guy's idea of how to get that there versus and we have general patterns. They, they use basically what they call, you know, they're what you'd say would look like a topo map, okay? It's got peaks and valleys and all that kind of stuff. That's basically what we use when we build a top. We're going to talk about parts of instruments, okay? And this is where um, we can kind of 
I can give you as much or as little information about this as, as you want. We're going to briefly go down through these different items, okay? Because a lot of times, a lot of your sales happen around these different items, especially on the lower price points. When you have somebody who comes in and says, I bought this off of the internet for 99 bucks, and you have to say to them without saying, you just bought a piece of junk, how do you talk them into renting an instrument from you? Why should they invest $30 a month or whatever it is that you, you're renting for <coughs> versus buying an instrument for 99 bucks where it would be done and over with, right? So we'll go through these parts. What I always like to, to tell parents is as, as we go through this, you'll see what the costs are and what the difference is as we talk about them. And when you add all this up, if somebody buys a, an instrument for nine, you know, 99 bucks, and they put in all the work that really needs to be done to this instrument to make it a real instrument, they're going to spend more than if they had just bought a VL80 from you in the beginning or rented an instrument and built up some equity towards the purchase of an instrument. And you'll see that as we go through that. Okay, it's very, very clear. And as you explain this to the parent, you are much more likely to convert them to a rental or to a, a sale of a good quality instrument versus just saying, well, they're not good quality and, and you know, and they're this and that, you know, and what, you know, we'll talk about the differences and you'll, it'll be very clear to you. Okay, the first thing I want to talk about is the base bar. And I like to sort of get this out of the way because we hear the base bar and the base bar is, when we go through all this other stuff, if you have a person who's trying out an instrument and you want to be able to adjust it or make some sound, you know, I don't know, you, do you have a string person on staff? <coughs> like, a, I mean, a string repair guy? Yeah. Oh, that's, okay, that's perfect. Me. Okay, good. When you go to Michael and you ask him to change the sound a little, you've got a customer and you're working with this customer and the customer says, oh, the G string's a little stuffy and you take it to Michael and you say, okay, the G string's stuffy and he goes, okay, how is it stuffy? Well, it just, the sound seems to be like this and he has to interpret that and actually make the instrument do something different. We're gonna talk about all those things. And when he's done everything he can and the, the customer says, it's still stuffy and it, it just doesn't really, eh, a lot of times that's the bass bar, okay? Because we do everything by hand, sometimes you're going to get a base bar that's put in too tight. Putting in a base bar is probably one of the most difficult parts of building an instrument. <coughs> you have this top that's carved out like this, and then you have this base bar that's supposed to fit it, and then the wings of the base bar, the ends of the base bar, kind of stick up, and you actually glue them, you press them down, and you glue them in, and you tighten them. That, depending on the gap between the top and the base bar, if it's this big and you pull them together, that's a lot of tension. If it's this much and you pull them together, that's not as much tension. So it really depends on how much tension you put on that top, whether it's really tight and nasally, and it depends on how durable the wood is in many ways. If it's a very dense piece of wood, you can go a little tighter, or you can graduate the top a little thicker. There's all these things that, uh, so many variables that go into a top, Base bar is definitely one of them, and there's times where we send out an instrument and people are like, I just cannot make this thing sound good. They'll send it back to us, we'll actually pull the top, we'll remove the base bar, and we'll put a new base bar in, okay? Can you point on a violin where the base bar is? Yep. Yep. The base bar is on the base side of the instrument, okay? That's how you can remember it. It goes about three quarters of the length of the instrument. Which is one of the reasons why you should, why you should never left string a violin or any... Well, when we actually make a left-handed violin, we move the base bar. So we actually put it on the other side. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, we have, uh, we probably do two or three a year. And we have somebody who just want, and to be honest with you, most of the time they know, it's just like, it would be, can I get a left-handed violin? It would be really cool if I could get one. Sure, yeah, we can do one. And we have a template for it, and we can do it in a variety of different models. You know? So the, yeah, the bass bar runs along the side, like I said, it goes about three quarters of the length of the instrument. And you, when you look inside the F-hole, when you pass this around, you can actually see the bass bar inside there. All right, so, and here's a picture, actually, of him putting in a base bar on a cello top. Is it ever carved out of the top? As though it's one chunk of wood and they carved the baseboard as uh, part of the top? Uh, no, we've, we've always put in, it's actually made out of um, pine, I believe, a lot of times, so it's made out of different material. Yeah. And its functionality is? It creates the rigidity. So I've actually played a violin without one. Um, it was amazing. We had a violin that came in, and they strung it up, and they were getting it all ready, and nobody really looked in to, to see. And, and I played it, and it was like, it was just, there was no real sound to it. It was like, almost like, like wiggling a piece of, it was like this. And you play on it, it was, it was 
really weird. And uh, we're like, what is wrong with this thing? And it turns out that it was, uh, there was no bass bar in it. So there just was no rigidity. It was just, there was a very airiness to the sound that wasn't solid. So that, that bass bar is really what creates that rigid, rigidity and allows the vibrations to actually, uh, doesn't affect necessarily the volume of sound so much, but the centeredness of the sound. And, and Michael, did you have a question? Uh, it is called the bass bar because it's under the bass leg. On the bass side, and it's a bar. Not because it adds bass frequencies to the top. I don't think so. I mean, you might ask a violin maker who would say, "Yeah, that's the reason they set it," but I don't. I don't think so. Well, I was think that giving it that stiffness would allow a larger waveform to exist at the top instead of all the harshness you were hearing. It could so be, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, everybody I've always talked to, they just say it's the bass part. It's on the bass side of the instrument. It makes it better. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It better. So um, the next part is the sound post. Now the sound post. This is Michael's best friend, because this is absolutely the easiest, simplest way to change the sound of an instrument, okay? You can completely change the sound of an instrument, even more than changing strings, and it takes a lot less time, and um, you, can, you can really manipulate the overtones that come out of that instrument, okay? So, does everybody know what the, the sound post is? No? Okay. Pass that around again. You'll see on the treble side of the instrument, just behind the bridge, you'll see a post. Okay, and that's the sound post. The sound post is not glued in; it's just put in by pressure. And it's it basically looks, if I can get this right, it looks like this. Okay, because you're you're you have arches, right? And it's wedged in, and it's wedged in so you you have to cut the the top of it like this, and the bottom of it like this, so that it fits in flat, and there's no space on either side so it, all your vibrations travel through without hitting a dead spot, right? So it's incredibly difficult to actually cut this thing and make it fit in there right. But, oh, there you go. <laughs> so this is, if you look at this, okay, you'll see, you see how this side is slanted up and this side is slanted down. That's because it fits in at this angle as the, the arches go, right? And so this is a sound post setter and what they'll do is they'll just dig this in and they'll then set the sound post and they'll move it around. This is a violin sound post setter. And they'll move it around, they'll just kind of knock it and move it around. And the idea is to have it straight up and down and exactly flat with the top and back, which you do perfectly, right? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Every so time. Hard. It is so hard to do. Right, yeah, it is. Leslie actually really <coughs> likes setting sound. I okay, don't. Good. Actually. Good. <laughs> I don't set my own sound posts. I've done it a few times. And I get frustrated. I give up, and I move on. I take it to somebody who knows how to, what they're doing. So it's just a it's a big pain. But man, it's it makes just such trial a huge and error, difference. right? In like getting the feng shui of how to. I mean, yes and no. Um, when I uh, part of my experience was actually working retail, and I worked at Milano Music for about five years, and I was their string their string guy there. I had a good working relationship with my with my repair guy, and I could take in instruments to him and say, I don't like the way this sounds, and he'd look at the sound post, and he he knew generally where I liked my sound post to be. He knew what kind of sound I was looking for, and he could generally get it without even me playing it or saying anything to him. He could put it generally where I needed it to be, and he might move it, you know, a quarter of a millimeter one way or another or something like that, but generally he would get it right where I needed it because I generally liked a certain type of sound. I liked a certain amount of volume with enough overtones, so on and so forth, that I felt worked really well for that age of kid that was playing that type of violin. It's sonically, what does what the sound post do mean? Okay, so it's creating, it's transferring sound waves, right? From top and to bottom. From top to bottom. So okay. it's a solid vibrational thing. It's right, okay. exactly. And what it's doing is changing where those vibrations go through the instrument, okay? Uh, so if I have, if the sound post is here, Okay, and I move it closer to the arch, what's going to happen with that sound post? It's going to get looser. It's going to be looser. So what's going to happen with the sound? It won't resonate as much. There's, there, there won't be you know, the amplitude. It'll be quieter. It's just quieter. Yeah. Right, so it'll be a little softer, but it will probably be a little bit warmer. Okay. Now, what if I move the sound post towards the G string? And I'm not talking like all the way over, but what if I moved it a millimeter to the towards the G string? You'd hear more low end? Yeah. Yep. You'd have more focus on the low end. 
but you take away from the high end, it's a zero-sum game, okay? So finding out the exact position that works the best for the particular player may be totally different with every instrument. So it's almost like your, your old-school EQ. In a yeah, way. Like it is. It's exactly that. <laughs> it's exactly that. So when you go in your, your radio, it would almost be cool if we could figure out exactly where on this goes based on where people preset their radio EQs, you know? I mean, if you go into somebody's their car stereo and they have their treble at a certain thing, their mid at a certain <coughs> thing, and they've done all this, and that's the sound that they like to hear, that's probably going to be somewhat fitting to the type of instrument or sound they're looking for from an instrument as well. And this is basically what does that by moving that around. And generally, it's in this area. It's right? always, yeah. Where it's at it's right now, side. you'll see it move from that area a millimeter to a millimeter and a half <laughs> in any direction. And that millimeter to millimeter and a half difference will make all the difference in the world. But if that sound post falls over, how do they, like, do they reach in with tiny little yeah. tools? Yeah, they reach in with this. Oh, that's okay. Or a grabber. Yep. Yeah. yeah, so sometimes they'll have a little grab or whatever. What most, what your real good violin makers will do is they'll do this and they'll shake it to here. They'll take their sound post setter and they'll pull it through and then they'll pull it out. And then they'll just, you know, stick it in and they'll go back in and they'll set it in. Um, and uh, when I worked at Milano's one summer, I wanted to um, learn more about this kind of stuff. And I'm not a very handy guy. Um, and so they said, why don't you start with this? And in about 10 minutes, I moved to bridge cutting because I just, it was, <laughs> it was ridiculous. I'm like, this is crazy. But the guys who can do it really well, I mean, they can just stick it in and boom, and they're hitting it around. I've, I've been to some really, you know, good violin shops and seen these guys. I mean, they've got this, like, they whack at it. They don't even push it. Some guys will go like this, and they'll get in, and they'll just kind of ease it in where it needs to go, and they'll just kind of tap on it because tapping it doesn't, you don't have the chance of moving it too much. It just moves it very little. And again, you're talking, sometimes you're talking a half a millimeter or less, they'll move it one way or another to make sure that it's either upright or it's in the right place or wherever it is. Number one, easiest, best way to change the sound of an instrument. Next one, uh, not in fingerboard. So this is all feel, okay? This is all feel. When, as a violin player, when I pick up a violin and I play it, instantly, as soon as I, I pick up this violin, I'm making assessments about this violin. And your nut and your fingerboard are two of those major um, major things. Your fingerboard has what they call scoop. Okay, so if I push down on either end, okay, at the, at the top and the bottom, I should be able to see what we call scoop. Okay, it's a very um, technical term. <laughs> that means that the fingerboard should have some scoop in it, right? If it doesn't, if the, the string is flat against the, the fingerboard, it's going to buzz. Okay, it's also how you can easily <coughs> tell if there's bumps in the fingerboard. Okay. Anytime you have these bumps, a lot of times it's going to touch where that string is. So you should be able to slide a business card in there. Okay, up here it should be about one millimeter. Anybody know what it is here at the end of the fingerboard? The heights? About the top. I'd say four, but three, three point five, four. Yes, yeah, so typically it's three and five. I'm sorry, three on the low side, five on the high on the G side. Okay, so you'll want to check those. What typically there's a few different things that we look at when somebody says to me, um, you know, this fingerboard, this bridge is too low. The first thing I can say that I always tell them is you never know if the, the bridge is too low or too high until you've checked the neck angle. So the neck angle here, as the instrument expands and contracts, the neck angle can change. Okay, So we can go up or down based on whether the instrument is expanding or contracting, which changes the distance between here and here as far as how this height is. If the neck angle goes up, right, that measurement goes down. If the neck angle drops, it's just like on a guitar, but in a guitar you have a truss rod, right? On violins you don't have that truss rod, so what you do is you either send it to a different climate or you change the bridge height. And in fact, on your <coughs> better cellos and your higher end cellos, they typically have two bridges. They have a winter bridge and a summer bridge because you're gonna have a lot more movement than you would on a violin, okay? so. Um, the, the neck angle, you measure it from the top to, to where the fingerboard is, and it should be at a certain height, okay? About 20 millimeters. It should be anywhere between 19 and a half and 21 and a half millimeters or so. We, we really like to see it a, no more than a millimeter difference from about um, 20 to 21 in that range. You're talking from the top to the string? From the top to the, the top of the fingerboard. Okay. Okay. Yeah, sometimes you see pretty whack. Sometimes yeah, they're like, flat mm, or yeah. whatever, and it, even sometimes that happens with us, you know, if, if we have a batch of instruments with a wood 
you know, on a, especially on the, the better instruments, they've all been aged long enough, you should have any of those problems. But sometimes on student instruments, especially cellos, so you're going to see a lot more movement. On your 80 cellos that are laminated, you're not going to see that kind of thing. But, so you want to see that. The other thing is, again, you want to see that it's about a business card length. It's the easiest way to check is just to take a business card or one of these is fine too. And just slide this in here. And if it's not just barely touching, if you can't do this with it, if it falls out, that's too too big. It's too tall. And that's going to not be, it's not, It's like on a flu, you know, um, you got to really push down because it's not seating well or whatever. It's the same concept that it's very easy to check if somebody says it doesn't feel good. Just stick a card in there and just see if that, if it, it should just barely touch in there. And if it's too big, if it, the card just falls out, it's too high and it's not going to feel good. And you're probably not going to sell that, that violin very quickly. Um, strings. We did. We briefly talked about strings. Strings. Um, you know, there's steel core strings, which is more considered a student instrument string. Uh, it's a very brighter string. You have um, uh, synthetic core strings, which are supposed to simulate a gut sound, but more durability and longer lasting. Okay. Then you have a, a traditional gut, and the gut can either be unwound or wound. Okay. And then there's a gazillion different, you know, sort of things that different, you know, the Daria will make a string that's got two different cores in it, you know, and things like, like that. But generally you have either synthetic, steel, or gut, and gut is either wound or unwound. And wound is a silver or the something silver, yeah, that's or wound or around it, so it looks like a, a guitar yeah, string. Right. Low guitar strings are wound, high guitar strings are not. Right. So generally on violins, your E strings will not be wound. On some of your higher end strings, because you'll have a wound E string, which is a little bit odd, but for the most part, it will be um, either a plated, you know, a solid steel E string, okay? And then your other your other one, we typically put dominance on moments all of them because they're just a generally, you know, every day everybody knows them. Uh, but there are lots of other types of strings like obligato. Obligato and Ava Parazzi are made uh, by Parastro and they're completely at different ends of the spectrum. So your Ava Parazzi's are high tension, very soloistic sound. Your obligatos are very warm and uh, lower tension and much more orchestral type sound. So um, we put them on, just depending on what kind of sound the player wants, we can set them up in any way. If, if an instrument has a certain quality to it, say it's a dark brooding instrument and you want to bring out some of the mids and highs, you can put a higher tension string on it to help counteract that. Right. A lot of times you'll have to change the sound post a little bit as well when you do that. Bridges, and I'm kind of going through these a little fast uh, for time's sake, but does anybody know the different parts of the bridge? String players, especially. There's feet. They, there are feet. <laughs> what are the little parts above the feet? Wings. Ankles. <laughs> 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 What's this part right here? This gap right here? The heart. That's the arch? arch. This part up here? Heart. The heart. Good. What are these? Wings. Nope. No. Well, the, these little parts of the wings, yeah. Arms? What's this? There's holes. Kidneys. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we humanize most of the parts of the bridge, okay? And the reason is, if you want to change the base side of the instrument, you take material out of the, the uh, kidney on the base side of the instrument. If you want to change the treble side, you'll take material out of the kidney on the treble <coughs> side of the instrument. If you want to take... Um, if you want to um, create a little more vibration, something that's an instrument, you just think about it, the thicker the, the um, bridge is, right, the less vibrations you're going to get, the brighter that instrument's going to be generally, okay? As we take material out of that instrument, okay, we can actually change it. We can, we can add a little bit more here or here. We can take a little bit out of here and change those vibrations in the bridge by taking material out. So that's how they, again, sort of customize an instrument as they do that. We do very little work on them, okay? Especially on the lower end instruments. If you pay for our highest setup on our highest level instrument, I think it's 200 bucks or whatever we charge for a setup, something like that. Um, we spend a lot more time on that, adjusting that instrument and getting exactly where it needs to be. Tailpiece, and I, the student instrument, we have a couple of different types of tailpieces. And there's lots of different types of tailpieces. There's hill style and so on and so forth. But generally, the two materials is wood and like a carbon type material. Okay? Um, we call these, these are a branded tailpiece Whitner. Okay? And they're, they're actually German. We call them German Whitner. 
um, so that people understand that it's the real thing. Uh, for a long time, people, uh, they were making some Chinese knockoffs, and they were horrible. You could <coughs> drill the screws out, the screws break, it was, it was bad. So we, all of our instruments come with German weight their tail pieces when it's this style. We put these on all student instruments, as well as cellos, okay? Um, they're a lightweight material, so the vibrations transfer very easily. And then we have on our better instruments, we have a wood tail piece. But why would we use this versus a wood tail piece with four fine tuners? Yeah, it's more resonant. Why is that? It's plastic. <laughs> it's like it's a plastic versus a wooden comb and a harmonica. It's yeah, it, it's not even that because originally they were all metal, they yeah. and they weren't quite as resonant as wood tail pieces. But they had a different reason why they were really sought of as a better better than with fine tuners. And that's because if you look at this one, this one only has one, which is on the smallest steel E string, uh, it doesn't make a lot of difference. But on the other um, fine tuners, if this had fine tuners, you'd see that on all of the strings, the string length is shortened by almost a half an inch. Where with this one, the string length is the natural string length. So think about it. You've got these these string um, makers who are you know have all these physics. You know, they an A string. How many times a second does an A string vibrate? One hundred forty. Right. 440 times per second, right? So this A string has to ring at an A at a certain tension, at a certain length between the nut and the bridge, and then the bridge in here, right, has to make it vibrate at an A at the right tension. And they make the string to specifically do exactly that for the right diameter of the string. Otherwise, all the strings would be the same diameter, right? Well, then all of a sudden you shorten it to put a fine tuner on means that you're not going to get as good a tone out of that string as you would with a Whitmer tailpiece, okay, or something what we call integrated fine tuners. <coughs> so we do that because it makes a better sound. Okay. But all those other things like being durable and things like that are also a consideration, but the, the biggest thing really is the, the, uh, the sound. Okay. Chin rests. i got two different styles of chin rests. Can anybody tell me the name of the different styles of chin rests? Kaufman and Ordinary? Um, Kaufman is, yes, but Kaufman is, is actually a name of a chin rest. This is not really a Kaufman chin rest. Um, Kaufman is a type of Dresden style chin rest. Okay, so there's a million different uh, models of chin rests, like a Kaufman, okay, but the general style is considered to be a Dresden style chin rest, and this is a Guarneri style chin rest. Okay. Just because so it's center mount, or um, or are you talking about the shape now? We're talking about the shape. Okay. okay. This this over the tailpiece. This style. Everything about this style. This is. They have one called a Paganini, right. which is a Dresden that's mounted center over the over this. Tailpiece. Okay. But this style is considered to be a Guarneri. This is a Dresden. Does anybody know why we'd use one versus another? Feel is a big thing. We use Dresden because they feel better to students. This tends to, over the tailpiece tends to be too much, for especially in smaller instruments for kids. So we use Dresden. But why would we use these? It's overtones. Because it's where the chin rest is clamping on the body of the violin. Exactly. That's exactly it. Yeah. So inside the instrument, there's a block. There's a block here, there's blocks here, and there's a block here. On the Guarneri style, it's actually clamped onto the block. Okay, where the, the vibration is already basically dead because it's glued to a block. Here, it's on the side. It's on the side and it's clamped not on a block. And so it actually restricts the vibrations. Okay, so theoretically, it's not as good of a, a sounding chin rest. So here, you see um, the, this guy's putting, he's what they're calling inlaying the purfling. Okay, so we don't call it binding. <coughs> We call it purfling, okay? And and um, the purfling is basically a laminated piece of material. Typically, you have ebony, two pieces of ebony, and then um, you might have a spruce or you might have uh, some other material in here, um, and they'll laminate those those pieces together. So from the black to the black, and the the piece in between are all one, typically when you inlay it's all one piece. So it's not like they're inlaying this tiny little black strip and then another one exactly parallel with it. No, it's, it's actually laminated together. Then they'll gouge the top and inlay it. And it's all done by hand. As you can see, this guy doing, he's actually, he's gouged it by hand, 
and inlaying it by hand. Hundred dollar eBay violins typically will have painted on purfling. Right. That's not actually going to help the structure of the top. <coughs> right. And so, <laughs> why? Why? It, what is it there for? What does it do structurally? Keeps the grain from splitting. Yeah. So if you hit it, which it's going to happen nine times out of ten, the kid's going to be walking around with his instrument. He's going to bang into something, hit it, or whatever. If you hit the, the side, it creates the rigidity and the size of it. It keeps cracks from going up to the top. Okay. The other thing sometimes is if you have a crack in the top, it'll go here. Sometimes you can actually cleat that without having to pull the top, which is which also makes it nicer. But generally, it's to keep cracks from going up to the top. And how can you tell whether it's painted or inlaid? Yeah. There's dimples uh, where they actually put the the inlay and where it comes together. There's dimples, so you can see those little dimples. Sometimes, even on painted instruments, they'll dimple it. But you can tell. You can tell where it's come over. They they cross over the inlay like this, and you can see the dimple where it, where it's put together. And sometimes around the edges, like this one, you can see around the edges where it's been. It's not exactly uniform. On and sometimes the on, grain of the it'll be too. all painted on. You can tell it's exactly uniform. There's no waviness. It's it's perfect. And anything that's perfect is not for real. The reality is, if your kid is that serious and really wants to go to college, someday you're going to be spending ten grand or more on a violin. Period. You know, but for right now, what they're wanting to do, we don't really need to spend that much. We really only need to spend about fifteen hundred to three thousand to get what you need, and what you need will and, and it'll be able to help you get into to regionals or all state or whatever that goal is that you've heard that them them talk about. Okay, you have to provide them some perspective. Otherwise, they yeah, seventeen hundred. I mean, that, is that like the best I can buy? They have no idea. They have no idea, mm -hmm. right? And what I find is, I worked with a store um, in Memphis, and. They had never <coughs> sold a violin, I think, over like, it was like 12 or 1500 bucks. Never sold a violin over that much. Their average sale price now is like 2500 bucks. That's their average sale price now because when a parent walks in, they say to that, that parent, this is the reality of it and this is really where you should be and they show them some instruments in that price range. And what I always tell people is, look, I'm never going to show you something that's not in the price range I told you, but I'm not going to tell you what the prices are on these instruments because you might find one that's a little less expensive if I tell you what all these prices are, you as a parent are going to want all the less expensive stuff, and your child is going to want all the most expensive stuff, right? Rather than doing that, you're going to be in this price range. And I always tell people on in, on violins as you're doing going through this violin sales process, think price ranges, don't think price points. The last thing you want to do is get into a, with a customer. Why is this violin? <laughs> Why is this violin 800 bucks more than this violin? <coughs> okay. Well, this violin was built in Germany, and it's European tone woods, and this is Chinese tone woods. But there's not quite as much grain on this one as there is on this one because that's because this is Chinese tone wood, and, and in Europe, European tone woods right now is way expensive to buy European tone woods. So on your less expensive instruments, well, that's not less expensive. Well, it kind of is because you. When you start getting into why an instrument is 800 bucks difference between the two, 800 bucks is nothing. And this one might sound better. It's just the way it is. We had a guy, we had an artist in this last week in, in, in Pomona, and he was trying out all these cellos, and he picked out one that was like $2,000 less than the other ones because it worked for him. He liked that instrument. I, I just, I want you guys to think about Everything between fifteen hundred and three thousand dollars is a price point. And yeah, there are differences. We age the wood a little bit longer. We spend more time on the instrument, so on and so forth. But I'm telling you, there are going to be times, and I think there was even in this. I think we found a violin that was less expensive. It was one of the Romanian violins that was less expensive. That sounded really good. Well, and if you start looking at points, like what is the difference, and you start going like this, like he was just doing, and you know, and all that. Sometimes you'll find the exact same instrument. Well, it's still it's European tones. It's still made in China. It's still this. It's still that. But one's a thousand more. Then how do you justify that? You, you're, you've worked yourself into a corner. You're supposed to explain something to the customer. And you're, well, it just is. Right. You know that. So there are times you can get into the details, and details will bite you in the ass. Right. And what I tell people is, I always say, you know, people who want to know a little bit more. Well, why is this one a thousand bucks more? I always tell them, look, remember, violins have this gigantic price room. So even though in your head it seems like a thousand dollars is a lot of money. Ultimately, a thousand dollars is the difference between the, this piece of wood cost a little bit more and was aged longer, and and the ultimate process of building that—that's your thousand dollars. I mean, the dude who did it 
charged a thousand more because he's that much better. Right. And you can't you right. can't measure that. You we, can't you know. Right. We spend a little bit more time building this file and this one. German labor is a little more expensive than Chinese labor. The reason that it, the most expensive instrument that Eastman sells is a Chinese instrument. Mm -hmm. Okay. We use Adirondack spruce. Okay. We use uh, um, this particular instrument. Actually, is all Chinese. We now, with this model, have gone to Adirondack spruce and so on and so forth. But this particular one, which is one of my favorites, is a Guarneri pattern made with all Chinese wood. Okay. But the difference is that the reason this is more expensive is because it was done in China. We put all the handwork in it. Everything that I talked to you about in the beginning. When somebody says, "Why is this Chinese one as the same price as this German one, or more than this German one?" You have to understand that German instruments are made by machines these days. It doesn't have the the handwork and the artistry that goes into a handmade instrument, which it, we do have on the Chinese instrument. So even though it's maybe made in China, the materials and the and the craftsmanship that goes into this Chinese instrument is completely different. It's not necessarily where they're made, it's how they're made and who made them. And I try to educate them first, and then based on what their perception is, if, you know, like for instance, in certain areas, uh, I was just in Toronto, and there's a the store in Toronto, they don't sell Chinese stuff. You know why? Because that entire place is Chinese. The entire town is Chinese, and Chinese people do not want to buy Chinese. They look at it, they have their own prejudice about Chinese product, and you're not going to overcome that. Nine times out of ten, you're not, and it's not even worth it. So you show them everything German that you have, and Romanian, and you let them choose from something European. You know, I mean, you're going to have those customers, it's just the way it is. So my feeling is if you take the time to get to know that customer a little bit, get to know their needs, what I'll even do sometimes is have them show me what they struggle at on their instrument. Because then what I want to do before they play anything, I want their parents to see them struggle on their instrument that they have right now. I want to see them struggle on their student instrument. Because nothing is better than watching your kids struggle on something to make you want to upgrade the, the equipment they have. You know, If you see them struggle, what do you want to do? Get them private lessons, you want to get them this, you want to get what they need to help them do better. And then all of a sudden you put an instrument in their hands and you can see them brighten up and, and all of a sudden they can do something they couldn't do. That right there shows the parent why they're here and why they're in this store. So take the time to do that. The last thing I want to say is let them use their bow. If somebody's trying out a trumpet, you would never give them, if they were, if they were playing on a 7C, you would never give them a 3C to try out a professional trumpet, right? You'd give them a 7C. You'd let them try it with their, their mouthpiece. Same thing with an instrument. If they're coming from a three-quarter to a full-size instrument, let them try the instrument with their three-quarter bow. There's no problem with that because they're used to the weight, the length, all of that. Let them start with that when they when they really feel comfortable. Then say, okay, now try a full-size bow and see what you think with a full-size bow. It's no different than trying out a trumpet or a you know, saxophone or something else where you just have them use their, their mouthpiece. How do you help a student who's struggling with their own technique that is okay. that is poor. Sure, there's very easy things to do. There's a couple of very e easy things to do. When the kid is here, <coughs> he does this. Which you're gonna hear a lot because they're embarrassed to play and, and be loud, right? I just walk up to them and I just push, push, put some weight down. I push their elbow down a little bit, right? And I have them push down. <laughs> and I have them put weight into the bow, right? I tell them move their bow a little bit. It's like playing a flute. I always tell people when they're playing Amadeus flutes and, and Haynes flutes, to put more air through. You just have to do the same thing with the bow. Push down a little bit, okay? One thing you'll see on a lot of kids is they'll do this. With the same amount of pressure, if I do this, all I did was I took my elbow from here to here. We don't want to push the sound out. We're not beating the violin into submission. We want to pull the sound out. So if you see a kid who's struggling and he's getting this really scratchy, awful sound on an instrument, have him drop his elbow. Just tell him, just poke at his elbow. <coughs> I always just walk up to a kid and I just say, put your elbow down. I just poke him right in the elbow. Put your elbow <laughs> down. And I just tell him, you know, get your chicken wing down or whatever you want to do. Tell him to get his elbow down. All of a sudden, the violin opens up a little bit, okay? Use a little bit more bow. Get your elbow down, okay? and put a little bit of weight in. Weight comes from the first finger, okay? So just put a little bit more weight in, drop that elbow, and use a little bit more bow. That's gonna open that up. 
and don't be afraid to just whack their bow a little bit. You're not going <laughs> to hurt it. Just, I, I'll literally go up and just kind of, that's what my violin teacher used to be, do to me. You know, this Dr. Majors was this old portly guy who had white hair, and he'd walk up to me and, you know, do this on my bow, you know. It's not going to break it. Just go up there and, and they kind of get a kick out of it, you know, and just get them to put a little <coughs> bit more weight into that bow. And that'll open up the sound. Then all of a sudden they'll start hearing the differences between between instruments. Because if they're just going to do this, they'll never hear, hear the differences. How do you tell a parent? Because there are a lot of parents who are only focused on price. Yep. So is there a way to make it where okay. parents who don't care about the quality of the instrument as much? Well, this actually kind of worked as a negative in our situation because they ended up buying a violin from you guys. But <laughs> did we had a parent that came into your store and they only wanted a violin that was like what fifteen hundred bucks, right? We open up their world by talking about the idea behind the violence being such a price range and then saying, for your kid, we'll really just w focus on this price range. I try not to not even talk about price until I've qualified, until I've seen the kid play. Then I go into, this is what violins are all about. And then I say, this is what we feel like we need for your kid to be in Allstate or to be in regionals or to really be competitive in your chair auditions in seventh grade. This is where we really feel that you need to be, and I use a price range. That's the only time I, and I always say to them, I'm not going to show you anything <coughs> above or try and talk. To, this is what's going to be best for you. And I'm going to, so if you feel like a kid's in seventh grade, and he's taking his first chair auditions, he needs his really first kind of competitive instrument, put him in an instrument that's 12 to 1500 bucks. It'll be fine for him. It'll be good. If you get him in a $3,000 instrument, it might be too good. It might be, it might actually make him sound worse in some ways. It'd be a struggle for him, okay? So if you put them in the right price range and you have specific reasons to do that and you, again, use a price range and not a price point, very rarely you're still going to have those customers who are going to just be like, no, I'm going to spend it. And when they that way, find the best violin for that price that you can, you can find. But and leaving price right. off the table until the end. Yeah. And that, that's, that's the big Until you pull the instruments off and you say, this is what I'm going to do for you, and just giving them a price range of this is what we're looking at, so that they know in their head this is where I'm going to be, it helps every time. I think they went and they're buying some other high-end <coughs> violin or something, right? Is that what they, you said they were going to do? No. I think they're going to practice some more. Oh, yeah. is that what they're going to they do? Oh, good. I'll never forget, a couple years ago, we went to Santa Barbara and uh, went into Nick Rail's music. No, yeah. it was the other instrumental music center. Went to both of them. There's an instrumental music based in uh, Venture, uh, Santa Barbara. And I looked at the uh, ukulele, it was a uh, Lani Kai. I'm like, $350. You're kidding. I don't have anything close to that in my store. All mine are like 150 and they're cool. And this one they want 350 And I looked at three other ukes. There was one for 650 and one for 850 and one for like 7 Then I look back at that 350 and I'm like, well, that's pretty cool. I should buy this. You know, I went from this is stupid to I'm on vacation. I should help out uh, our buddy, whatever his name is. Brian. Huh? Brian McCann. Brian McCann, yeah. It's, we should, I, it'd be cool to say, hey, I bought this from you. You know, it'd be kind of fun. So I, I literally changed my mind. It, it, it put me in a different category from this is stupid expensive to this is actually... There's a thing in the employee manual that talks about how you buy. You should be aware of how you buy things because you're running into that. You're going to go look at stereo equipment and go, man, this, this uh, CD player is $500. There's no way. But when you start looking around and notice they're all more, that one starts looking better, and it becomes all of a sudden accessible. And I think we can relate that to violins, too. Because when they walk in and they see a $1,500 violin, their mind's blown. They go, this is silly expensive. But you open up the realm of $17 million, and all of a sudden that's a bargain. Obviously, that, that's such a great disparity that they're, they're going to blow off the $17 million. You know, that's You have to work your way. To me, the, the important range is ten to 50000 you have because that's realistic in their lifetime. That's what if their kid wants to go to college, they should be spending around ten thousand dollars on a violin. That's if you go to Phoenix Symphony, they're going to be playing on twenty-five, fifty thousand dollar violins. It's real. It's here. It's in Arizona. It's what is here. So giving that range is only to give them some perspective and then work them down to the ten to fifteen, fifty thousand dollar range. If you can get them to understand that ten thousand dollars is very realistic within the next few years, if their kid goes on. But for right now, you're only looking at fifteen hundred to three thousand dollars. That's the price gap that makes that seem normal and understandable. The other one is just to give a range, and then what I do is work my way back to where I'm going to put them. But making those numbers accessible and real to those people is a huge deal. We don't want to come off ever as elitist, but you do have to somehow figure out how to get them up into the realistic numbers of fifteen hundred. So. To three thousand dollars. The other thing too is not sell out of your own pocketbook. You can't afford a fifteen hundred dollar violin. Doesn't mean that your customer in front of you 
can't. That is right. the range in which they should be in order to maximize the, the investment that they're making as well as maximize the performance that the kid is getting. It's not, it's, there's nothing more irritating to me than when I walk into a store expecting to spend a thousand bucks and the guy's trying to talk me into a $500 thing because, you know, I mean, it's one thing if I'm expecting to spend this much and there's just no difference between the two, that's one thing. But sometimes they're telling me this stuff, I'm like, but I'm willing to pay <coughs> more for these other things because that's important to me. That's what I want. And it may not be important to you, <coughs> but your price range is different than mine. And honestly, it's irritating to me. The, the bow itself and how it's cambered and how it's put together, you can pull out more sound if it's a better bow. So when you're playing... <coughs> This is a Pernambuco bow. There's different types of wood bows. There's Pernambuco and Brazil wood for the most part. Brazil wood's the le less expensive. Pernambuco is the more expensive. It's more difficult to get. It's it's um, it, it's harder to find. Um, it's they say it's endangered. I think it's just Brazil not um, <laughs> you know exporting as much of it. Uh, Pernambuco is <coughs> only found in the region of Pernambuco, Brazil. Uh, Brazil wood you can find in Southeast Asia, you can find all over Brazil, and Brazil is actually named after the wood. The wood was actually named after a, di a dye that they get from the wood, so that they were originally getting from Southeast Asia, and then the country is so much of it in Brazil, that's why they call Brazil Brazil. Carbon bows are great because they're durable. Um, they don't, this is a, a fiberglass bow. We actually make, we put a tiny bit of carbon in our fiberglass bow so that it, it um, if you look what we call the throat in this area, it's more wood-like, so it has a more wood-like feel, okay? That's why this bow we feel is better than a glasser bow. Glasser bows have been around forever, they're very consistent, you know exactly what you're going to get with them, but they have to, they put a rod through here, and they have, they're very thick in the throat area, and that's because they tend to crack a lot, and so they do that for durability issues. We, like I said, we put a tiny bit of carbon in, not enough to call it a carbon bow, we just call it a fiberglass that's bow. That's a glasser. So this is a glasser. You can see the difference when you look at the throats. There's a huge difference between the two. And one feels clubby, and one feels more like a real bow. Okay? If I was to play on this bow... There's not as much sound, and the sound isn't as round as if I played here. So you can see there's, the more expensive you play in a, uh, you get in a bow, the better sound you're going to get, the bigger sound you're going to get, the more round and overtones you're going to get. But it's also harder to control. I've played on $200,000 bows, and they are really difficult to play on because they're so precise that if you don't play with really good technique, they sound bad, you know? So getting a good bow with the instrument is really important, and we typically, I always say, 30% of the price of the violin should be spent on a bow, until you spend 17 million, and there's just no bows at that price. But, <laughs> but if you're talking a $3,000 violin, spending $500 to $1,000 on a bow is not unrealistic. And if somebody walks <coughs> into a string shop, that's probably gonna happen. Here, you're probably not gonna see a whole lot of that. If somebody spends 3,000, you could probably say roughly 10%. You can get them at least into a $300 bow you're probably doing pretty good, you know. One of the w easy ways to show the customer the difference on a glasser versus e even the holds bow, which is their carbon fiber, is just holding your hand and going like this. Because all that weight at the top end of the bow, um, you can really feel it when you go back and forth on it. And you take this one, do the same thing, and there's a lot less weight there. And you think, you know, dum -dig -dum, dum -dig -dum, you're playing spiccato and very fast things. You want a lighter bow that responds better. And it's, it's just a very simple, easy way of showing the difference to a customer. Right. So one other quick, if I do a, if I do what they call sautier. I do that on, if this is Rosman. It's a pretty good bow. And that's in a very student level bow. It bounces, it responds really well because... I don't know if that has rosin. rosin. Um, because the camber, because of the throw area, because it's made like a wood bow, it actually responds <coughs> really well. This is about a $1,500 bow. Um, but if this glass was rosin and he tried it, it wouldn't work. 
No, what it would it? bounce, but it would be very uncrisp. It wouldn't be as tight as what you hear with this bow. 